Hello, I'm Simon Kennan, editor of Interventional Cardiology Review. I'm here at EuroPCR 2015 with Andrew Sharp to talk about renal denervation. Andrew, welcome. Thank Thanks. you for coming along. Pleasure. Uh, can you briefly take us through the underlying principles of renal denervation? Sure. So, renal denervation, as we know it, in the modern era as a catheter-based procedure, is actually the end point of 80 years of research. So in the 1930s, we knew that surgeons could open the abdomen, they could cut the sympathetic chain, and sympathetic supply to the splanchnic bed, and that would dramatically reduce blood pressure. The problem with that operation was that it was invasive, and there were a lot of side effects. It cut a lot of nerves that we didn't want it to cut, and the complications included loss of bowel control, loss of bladder control, marked postural hypotension. So when drugs came on the scene in the 50s and the 60s, uh, this operation fell away. There were thousands and thousands of cases of this done, particularly in America. Uh, and, uh, and we went back to drugs, and we thought that by developing drugs to block each mechanism involved in hypertension that we understood, that we would have enough. It's only when we realized that we were running out of drugs, we were running out of targets for drugs in hypertension, that uh, this concept was revisited. So a radiofrequency catheter is taken up to the renal arteries, and it heats the wall of the artery with radiofrequency energy, and uh, kills off the uh, sympathetic nerves that lie in the adventitia of the renal arteries bilaterally. And that's about one third of sympathetic outflow. Mm -hmm. So it does it selectively. It avoids some of these other body, body systems we don't want to be touched. And uh, if it's done properly and uh, effectively according to the animal models, it should in theory reduce sympathetic outflow and therefore blood pressure. So uh, that was the basis of the uh, original work that was tested in animals and then humans, uh, and uh, all was going quite well until recently. Okay, we'll come to that in a minute. Yeah. Um, you presented today some data on the UK experience of RDN. Yeah. Could you go over that with us? Sure. So, as you know, the UK are quite a conservative bunch. We tend not to jump on bandwagons. We tend to examine quite critically uh, the data that come out on these new technologies. And really that's emphasized in the data I presented today. So there's been over 10,000 cases of renal denervation by catheter performed worldwide to date. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but the UK experience, uh, I've collected uh, 18 centres worth of data out of the 21 centres that we think have done five or more cases in the UK. And that comes to some total for the UK of 253 cases out of 10,000 worldwide. And that reflects really the responsible and conservative approach that we've taken to this new technology while it's in its proof of concept phase and its early clinical work. These are really severe hypertensives. So uh, 18 centers using five different renal denervation technologies, 253 cases. The average office blood pressure is uh, over 180 systolic and over 100 diastolic. The average ambulatory daytime pressure is uh, 170 over 98. That's on five drugs. Right. So that is the most severe cohort of renal denervation patients treated and reported that we are aware of in the literature. Basically, the UK saved this technology for treating the untreatable. Right. Um, and um, uh, the results, as you say, I've reported to, uh, today. And it shows an office systolic blood pressure fall uh, at uh, 11 months after uh, these procedures on average of 22 over 9. Okay. And uh, an ambulatory fall, which we've got paired amb ambulatory blood pressure monitors in 70% of cases. And uh, the ambulatory fall is 12 over 7. Okay. So we always see that a little bit less with ambulatory. Can you give us some idea as to what uh, amlodipine would do? Uh, so oh, amlodipine over placebo. Uh, so I can tell you uh, in the fever trial, felodipine had an incremental blood pressure fall of 4.2 millimeters of mercury. Right. Again, of course, what we saw was a placebo drop of the order of 8 to 10 and a treatment drop of 10 to 14. Mm -hmm. But that 4.2 millimeter incremental difference from a single felodipine tablet resulted at five years in a 33% reduction in cardiovascular death. Okay. And this just goes to show how critical blood pressure is in cardiovascular events. Okay. That such a small drop in blood pressure can have such a profound clinical impact. Okay. Of course, the hope is that this is what real denervation could possibly produce. Okay, so placebo, quite an important word there. Hmm. So everything started to unravel a bit with Simplicity 3. That's right. Can you take us through that trial sure. and the results of it? Sure. So Simplicity 1 and 2 were open label. We didn't have a sham control out. 
It's no placebo control. And of course, when you give someone a procedure, we frequently see this in PCI, sometimes patients feel better whether or not we think we've got a nice result. And uh, in Simplicity HCN3, there were over 400 cases randomized in a two to one fashion, where uh, two thirds of the cohort got the procedure, one third of the cohort were put to sleep under deep sedation, and they got a renal angiogram, so no denovation. But when the patients woke up afterwards, they all thought they'd had the procedure. So it was a very effective sham control procedure where they were, the patients were appropriately blinded. The patients were treated with the Simplicity Flex catheter, which is a one-point catheter. It's like a finger, steerable finger, like we use for EP cases. And uh, the idea was to draw a retrograde spiral, so multiple burns in a, a spiral fashion. We don't do them all at the same point in case we create renal artery stenosis. We do them as we pull backwards. In both arteries and the idea that that would effectively denervate the meshwork of sympathetic nerves. Uh, we uh, expected this to be a positive trial, pretty much everybody expected this to be a positive mm -hmm. trial. The open label data were showing 30 point drops, 20 point drops in blood pressure. In patients who were previously deemed untreatable, they have an open label denervation and the blood pressure drops a lot. Uh, what we did see was a 14 point drop in the treatment arm of HTN3. The problem is we saw a 12 point drop in the sham arm, leaving a difference of only about two millimeters of mercury. So initially it looked like a resoundingly negative trial mm -hmm. and it failed to show the benefit of real donation. I think that's right, it has failed to show the benefit of real donation. So I guess the question, next question is why? Mm -hmm. So the first and most obvious thing is that renal denervation might not work. I think anybody in the field has to accept that. Mm -hmm. We've had a negative, well-designed trial that shows no incremental difference. We have seen blood pressure falls. It's not as though we didn't replicate what we've seen to some degree in observational studies. We've seen a blood pressure fall. Mm -hmm. The problem is we saw a blood pressure fall without the treatment. So the, the problem with HTN3 is that there, there were many moving parts within the trial. Patients who went into the trial were supposed to be on stable medication regimens. And in fact, about 40% of the patients within the trial had medication changes during the course of the trial. That's right. against protocol. Right. So it was deemed that it was acceptable to change their drugs if it was uh, of significant clinical necessity. Whether 40% needed uh, those changes in medication within such a short follow-up. What was the follow-up? Uh, the follow-up was uh, initially six months. If I okay. So it was a really short trial and uh, it was probably unnecessary for that amount of changes to take place. Yeah. The second thing is in HGN3, the technology was tested in a different population from how it had been tested in the open label observational studies. So, uh, this was the first American trial. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, one in four of the patients were African American. Mm -hmm. As you know, African Americans have different hypertension guidelines mm -hmm. reflecting the higher levels of salt sensitivity in that population. Yeah. And uh, there, there were people who thought in advance of this trial that African Americans might have a different response to Caucasians such that it was a pre-specified analysis of the trial to see whether Caucasians responded differently to African Americans. And in fact they did. African Americans actually had a slight blood pressure rise following denervation, and Caucasians had a fall in blood pressure of about six and a half millimeters of mercury versus sham control. Okay, and um, would that have been statistically significant? It was just. Right, okay. So uh, the question is, uh, what explains that? Is it physiology or is it something else within the trial? Mm -hmm. When one looks deeper into the data, it's clear there were more medication changes and more vasodilators prescribed during the course of the trial after the treatment phase in the African-American cohort and in the Caucasian cohort. So it's not just as simple as yeah. different blood pressure guidelines, perhaps different responses to different treatments for hypertension. Sure. It's also that something led to more drug changes within the different populations within the trial. Uh, so I, I think all we can say about HTN3 is that it was a negative trial. It has not proven the efficacy of real denervation. There were several moving parts, and I've only mentioned one or two. Uh, only 6% of the, of the treated patients got the recommended bilateral retrograde spiral technique. Right. So the, the treatment that we were supposed to give, only 6% got it. Uh, uh, that's a surprise, and that may have been a factor. Uh, so the idea is that the procedure perhaps is more difficult than we first sold it as. And uh, what we need now are pre-shaped catheters that automatically deliver retrograde spirals. Mm. And that may change the results. So I have been hearing murmurs of optimism coming out of 
the RDN people. Yeah. Uh, is there a reason for that, do you think? Well, there's a really well-run trial from Dr. Azizi from France uh, called the Dino Hypertension Trial, recently published in The Lancet. It wasn't sham controlled, but what he did was he rigorously controlled hypertension with a series of drugs administered to these patients in a formulaic fashion. And then he randomized the patients to having real denervation on top or not. So he controlled as much as possible for drug changes, for personnel changes, and then he subsequently denervated the patient afterwards. And he showed about a six, seven point drop, six or seven point drop in uh, systolic blood pressure, which actually is similar to the Caucasians in HTN3. Uh, and um, uh, the data I reported today, when you take out that section of blood pressure within our cohort, you also get about a six or seven point drop in blood pressure in our open label registry. So perhaps it's possible that real denervation does work and that it uh, results in a, a much smaller drop in blood pressure than we first appreciated. Yeah. But really, it, it has to be considered unproven until we go on to the next trials. And we try and control as much as possible for all these moving parts within HTN3 that may have affected the outcome. And are there any currently ongoing randomized sham control trials? Well, the FDA and the American Society of Hypertension got together and tried to work out what would be the best trial for proof of concept in real denervation next time around. It's been, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, a lot of money has been spent on this technology. Why? Because two-thirds of ischemic stroke are caused by hypertension and half of all heart disease is caused by hypertension. It is the number one driving factor and the number one cause of death worldwide. This is a, a really important technology and we need to know for sure if it works or if it doesn't. So the FDA got together with the American side of hypertension and came up with two potential trial designs. Uh, Medtronic have released their trial design now. Uh, uh, looking at patients on or off drugs uh, and uh, Boston are doing a very similar sort of trial and there are another two or three trials in planning all of which are trying to follow the advice from the FDA about what they believe would be the best way to design a proof of concept trial. So I guess we are another two, three, four years away from hearing anything? Actually uh, what's going to happen is that uh, they're doing pilot studies mm -hmm. of about a hundred patients and then uh, they're going to look at the results, take them back to the FDA, uh, and we're hoping that those results will be out in February or March of 2016. Right. The FDA is then going to advise on whether the study is continued and expanded, or whether a different trial design should be pursued, or whether we should just stop. Okay. So there will be small-scale pilot studies to sort of revisit everything from scratch. Sham control, control for drugs, or do them on no drugs. Mm -hmm. So this is a much more mild to moderate population. Yeah. Remember I said the UK experience is 170 over 98 on ambulatory monitoring in the daytime on five drugs. The new trials that are coming on stream by Medtronic, Boston uh, and several other companies, these are looking at much milder hypertension uh, of the order of 140 to 180 on no drugs right. or on three drugs. Yeah. Uh, and the idea being that we try and standardize care as much as possible, try and remove the uh, ability to vary drugs within the trial and after treatment and to try and get a much cleaner answer as to whether denovation has an incremental benefit to the patient's blood pressure control. Excellent. Andrew, thank you very much. Fascinating. Pleasure. Thank you very much.